so let's get started, shall we? As I said, um, I want to talk a little bit about how this, oh, okay, again, if you want to speak at length, let me know and uh, we'll recognize you and you can have the floor. Now we're finally getting to it. Okay, so how did that special session come about? Well, and most of you know, if you're from Virginia, and I assume you are, or at least practice law or have a law license here, and the 2019 midterm elections, the Democrats got control for the first time of both the state house and the governor's mansion uh, in over two decades. And of course, that led to an awful lot of uh, pent up uh, legislation that they had been uh, promising to do and hadn't been able to get through the legislature. Um, and it was a very busy session. Uh, Governor Northam, Lieutenant Governor Fairfax, and the new speaker, Ellen Fuller Corn. Uh, were uh, quite energetic. And so uh, I'm sure most of you know that there was uh, a lot of, uh, I won't call it controversial, but, but let us say uh, uh, new and novel legislation. And uh, of course the legislature is in session now for the 2021, um, what was originally going to be a short session, but some of you probably saw a couple of days ago, the governor said, no, we're gonna stay for 60 days. Uh, so we're going to have a long session again this year. Um, but uh, during that long session, there was a lot of uh, new and exciting legislation passed, including, and here's a little shameless promotion, uh, laws on the ownership and use of firearms and landlord-tenant law, which, by pure coincidence, we happen to have CLEs on coming up between now and, uh, and June. So if you haven't signed up for our landlord-tenant law update or our uh, program on the rights and responsibilities of gun ownership in Virginia, uh, go to our website. You'll find the links there, and uh, we certainly hope you'll sign up, and we hope by then everybody will be getting their emails with the Zoom links. Um, I don't know if changing our email server, which is Gmail, uh, Google, or if, uh, oh, sheer, thank you. Oh, yes, I forgot to mention, we play a game during these, uh, during these programs. It's called Spot the Typo. Spot the Typo in the PowerPoint. And we have our first winner, Miss Havener. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Give her a brownie point. Uh, so, yeah, Spot the Typo is our favorite game to play. It, let, it lets us know you're paying attention. Uh, but anyway, uh, we do have CLEs on those by coincidence, sheer or otherwise, and please look them up. Uh, okay, so after adjourning and returning to their homes, our dedicated senators and delegates began to suspect that perhaps, perhaps they might be coming back more frequently to Richmond than they had anticipated. Uh, specifically, there were calls from quite a few members of uh, the government, including uh, the lieutenant governor, and uh, the Senate minority, former majority leader, Tommy Normant from Williamsburg saying, um, look, we've got this COVID pandemic starting and it's going to mess up the budget that we just finished. It's gonna cause a lot of hardship. Maybe we need to have a special session. Um, the governor um, was perhaps uh, to be fair, um, somewhat concerned that that he needed to address these things more rapidly than a special session could. And so he began uh, dealing with it along with his uh, uh, commissioner of public health in the Virginia Department of Health by issuing executive orders and by uh, addressing it directly. Uh, still, the delay in actually calling the session, which he did not call until July 17th, was criticized by many people because the governor's call has to come 30 days before the session convenes. So it actually meant the session would not convene until August. Um, as I mentioned, the governor was using executive orders and other uh, uh, tactics to deal with the pandemic. Uh, and uh, there was, as there were in all states, criticisms that this was uh, beyond the actual power authorized to him by the emergency legislation, um, health emergency legislation that was actually in place. Um, 
what happened though was that uh, he tried to uh, get the Supreme Court to put a moratorium on evictions. And uh, so those of you who will recall that, that practice here in Virginia, and I do realize we have some of our, our Virginia attorneys abroad, so you may not know this. Um, the courts actually shut down for most of April and May um, were his repeated requests. Uh, Okay, um, she's now she's correcting my grammar. <laughs> among were, yeah, I guess among were. Okay, uh, <laughs> um, so they closed down for all but essential business, uh, you know, uh, uh, preliminary hearings and that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and that's her own comment there that she's an OCD lawyer. So, <laughs> oh, she's sending these messages directly to me. You're not seeing them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ms. Havener is, uh, is, uh, is being polite. She's not letting the rest of the world know about my, uh, about my typos. Um, anyway, um, once the court started reopening, uh, the landlords just started filing these eviction suits. Not, not all of them were obviously for COVID. I mean, some of them were probably longstanding issues. Uh, but anyway, the, the court agreed to issue a very brief two-week stay of these injunctions. And uh, the, uh, the result was that um, the, uh, the two-week moratorium ran out and the governor wanted the, to, to keep people from being evicted. So he tried to do, uh, I should mention, the chief justice had expressed to him uh, that he didn't think the court should be involved in making public policy decisions. And he considered this a public policy decision. So uh, knowing that the chief had said that, uh, the governor tried to do an end run around the Supreme Court by going directly to the chief judges of the circuit. And, and I'm sure... Anyone who knows anything at all about uh, about the the importance of precedent, and by that I mean precedent in terms of hierarchy uh, in the court system, I, I think you can imagine that that went over with the Supreme Court about as well as a lead balloon. Um, they were not not happy with the governor doing that at all. However, uh, they did go ahead and extend the moratorium again. Uh, actually, I believe it was twice, and then the third time uh, that it was set to expire, uh, the governor came back and said, I need you to do this again. Well, this was after he had already called the special session, and the court split, split four to three uh, with um, the chief justice and justices Kelsey and Chafin dissenting, saying, no, we don't think it's appropriate for us to do this anymore. Um, and the Chief Justice wrote a very short dissent. Justice Kelsey wrote a, a much lengthier one uh, to sort of go into the, the, the depth of uh, why this was probably not appropriate for the court. But I've just quoted here very briefly from the Chief's dissent. He said, the solution properly lies with the legislative branch and its responsibility to provide sufficient appropriations to fund rent relief efforts and with the executive branch to effectively administer such programs. The solution most assuredly does not lie within the judicial branch. And then he went on to say, the court should not create a preference for one set of litigants over another. The judicial branch should not put a heavy thumb on the scales of justice and deny property owners access to the courts and enforcement of their long established rights under the law. Uh, even, even the majority, which was signed by Justice Mims, and it was a little bit unusual. You, you don't really see orders from the court being signed by the justices. Justice Kelsey signed his dissent. Justice Mims signed for the majority in, in that opinion. Um, and I think it was, it was to emphasize the seriousness of this. Uh, those of you who get orders from the court know they're usually just signed by a deputy clerk, but these were actually signed by the justices. Um, and in his majority, he said that the extension was to give the governor and the General Assembly time to come to a solution because the session had been called and was in fact going to start, I think about eight or nine days after that order came out. So um, 
the court's order, yeah, it's 11 days. I said eight or nine. It's 11 days before the special session was a clear indication that it would be for the General Assembly to make any further provision preempting evictions of residential tenants. Now, in the meantime, in the meantime, and a couple of people need to mute. Let me see if I can do that. There you go. Um, uh, in the meantime, the special session's mandate had been expanded to include not only the budget and COVID relief, but criminal and social justice reform, issues which, in the view of the governor and some others, had been neglected in the regular session. Others, perhaps more cynically, suggested that these issues had risen to the fore in light of national events. And of course, I'm sure most of you know what I'm referring to. I'm talking about the uh, the protests uh, that were peaceful and the and the riots which were not in many American cities over uh, the perceived bias of the police in uh, their treatment of minorities, particularly uh, the deaths of several minorities in rather questionable circumstances of the police. Um, and having painted myself into a corner where it appears this CLE is about to turn political, I will artfully dodge away from that by saying we have reached the main topic of our seminar today, which is how did a special session that was intended to address the needs of the pandemic turn into a special session uh, in which the most significant legislation at any rate uh, dealt with the reforms in the criminal justice system. And that's how we got there. Uh, perceived bias, how many people got shot on the 6th in DC versus in Minneapolis, et cetera. Uh, well, again, uh, I'm gonna artfully dodge that one <laughs> so that we can get onto our main topic. Uh, that's a discussion for another day. So um, we're gonna look at 16 pieces of legislation that were passed during this session dealing at, in various degrees with criminal justice reform. I think some people would say that uh, part of it involves uh, uh, penal reform and that's, that's true as well. Uh, so the first one is empowering civil review boards with subpoena and disciplinary authority, which will become effective barring any changes in this legislative session on July 1st of this year. All of this legislation had some type of delayed effective date, uh, and you will be seeing the effective date on each slide as we introduce this information. So um, cities and counties in Virginia have occasionally created these advisory panels to offer local police chiefs input and advice, but those boards have been limited to an advisory role, only essentially making them toothless. The General Assembly voted to change that, allowing local governments to create panels that can field citizen complaints, investigate them, and issue binding disciplinary rulings. That, of course, was the, uh, the most uh, controversial part of that, was the binding rulings. It did draw pushback from law enforcement groups and divided activists, some of whom favored legislation that would require the establishment of these panels. So one of the things about this law is it is still up to the locality uh, to decide whether or not to create such a board. Uh, I will point out that also um, sheriff's offices are not included in this, and that is because sheriffs as elected officials are deemed to be uh, subject to uh, civilian review uh, through that aspect of their, their role, whereas police departments are uh, entities, creations of the local government. Uh, so that brings us to our first point of discussion. Um, I have not actually been able to see whether, um, oh, I see somebody has signed on as David. <laughs> they, he must have had to send his link to somebody. Um, hi, if you're seeing that your name is appearing as David Kohler. Um, uh, so Rodney, we have our first comment. Thank you, Rodney Turner, saying the sheriff's office exemption may be reconsidered. Yes, I have heard that. And that may be one of the changes that comes up in the, uh, in the legislative session this year. If you're seeing your name as David Kohler, you can actually go in there and, uh, and click on uh, your name and change it to your name if you want to do that. Um, and if you're seeing your name as David Kohler, uh, I would suggest that you uh, make sure that you have gone to chat and given us your name and bar number. Uh, because um, 
Otherwise, you will show up in the Zoom log as David Kohler. Um, yeah, I had to send the link to my to multiple people, unfortunately, now. So, so uh, yeah, if you are able to chat and uh, and you see that when you chat, it says that you're David Kohler, um, then please, uh, please uh, make sure that you uh, uh, <laughs> that you uh, uh, let us know that you are, in fact, not David Kohler. OK, um, so. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, we I see the, the the first person changed there. Uh, again, we apologize for these technical difficulties. We do have three hundred and four people online now, so uh, that's good. If you can hear my voice and you do not see the link to the CLE in chat, and you do, cannot and you do not get the email email with the CLE form, and you are here, contact us through the uh, website contact form, through email, through our phone number. However, our number one goal is to make sure you get the CLE credit you're entitled to. Uh, so as I was about to say, I haven't, I don't know for a fact that our discussion leaders are online. Um, and uh, let's see if I can search for them. Okay, Hyatt, I see you're there. Um, and so if they want to unmute, uh, and Hyatt, I see you're there. Um, if you want to unmute, if you have any comments on the civilian review, review boards, um, I'll turn it over to you. I think this can be very helpful, especially if the locality uh, creates a way for inmates to communicate with this review board. Um, it, I think it would also help defense attorneys because I know I spend um, sometimes a fair bit of time with my client talking about police activity that is not going to impact their uh, criminal defense. And so um, if the review board is accessible from uh, incarcerated clients, uh, I think that would be a very helpful aspect for towns to, to consider. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Um... Do we have any other, con how do you get on a criminal review board, uh, Mr. Leggett asked. Uh, I actually looked at a couple of the websites and, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, it, it's different for every locality. Some of them, it's a, an application process. Um, some of them, it's a, uh, 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 a selective process, people are, people are nominated. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I, can, uh, <laughs> that I can address it beyond saying that. Many localities served by sheriff choose to appoint a civilian reward that doesn't have the binding powers that come with, oh, May localities. Uh, yeah, they certainly can. Uh, there was no prohibition on this before. The, it was just that they were being given these powers specifically by statute. So that's a good question. Um, I don't know that the that the changes, the proposed changes um, that would include the uh, the powers for localities that do not have uh, police departments to have these boards for sheriffs will pass. And the reason why I say that is uh, anybody who's been in Virginia for any length of time knows that um, the uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having, uh, th that the power of constitutionally elected officers is given a very, very wide berth in Virginia. Clerks, Commonwealth attorneys, uh, uh, sheriffs, and treasurers, people like that, the legislature really does not like to involve themselves in that. Uh, and so I would say that uh, uh, we are probably uh, not going to see mandatory powers uh, for sheriffs. Uh, but one of the questions, and let me just go ahead and jump up to that if I can here. Um, so uh, I did a Google search and found just two such entities that have websites, Charlottesville and Fairfax. A little more searching and I found Virginia, uh, Virginia Beach has one, Richmond has one. 
only Fairfax and Virginia Beach belong to a national association um, uh, that uh, has been formed of these civilian oversight review boards. So some other qu questions that might come up, um, if there are others, uh, you would hope that they would be, you'd, able, you'd be able to find them on the web. Otherwise, how would people know to get in touch with them? Um, the exemption for sheriff's offices would apply to both urban and rural uh, jurisdictions. Are elections really an effective way to address abuse of force issues? Uh, particularly when you think about urban jurisdictions, um, so Mr. Turner says others are being in the process of developed and I'm, I'm sure there are and that's good. Uh, what, do you think civilian oversight will curb or encourage civilian litig litigation, uh, a civil litigation against police forces? Uh, are, the, the, are there any standards, experience, education, other qualifications which is going to be appointed to these boards uh, only if they're developed by the locality? Did this change include enhanced funding for localities? No, of course not. <laughs> what what whatever gave you an idea that <laughs> there would be that there would be funding uh, <laughs> I, I shouldn't laugh at that that's not nice uh, <laughs> oh um <laughs> but it's a, it is a good question yes um so but the answer is no um it has not been, uh, there has not been funded uh, supply. Um, are there any other comments? And I'm not sure if our other discussion leader is online. If he is, uh, could he please turn his video on and, and unmute? Um, and uh, I just lost my controls for my uh, PowerPoint. So let me get those back. There we go. And then let me minimize them. Okay. No, oh, no, that didn't work. <laughs> uh, let me try this again. There we go. Okay. Um, John, I think we skipped a question about more information regarding what the criminal review boards are and do. Okay. And thanks. Uh, yeah. The, my, my, uh, uh, can you please speak? We need, uh, can I please speak, Ms. Weiss? Uh, yeah, Ms. Weiss, if you want to unmute and turn your video on, we'll certainly be happy to hear from you. Hyatt, um, if, if you saw that question, um, can you address it? Yes. Um, <clears throat> it's basically uh, another means to address law enforcement uh, behavior and to address complaints about law enforcement and to review uses of force. Um, and to come to an ultimate resolution from a citizen's perspective rather than from a fellow law enforcement's perspective. That's my understanding of what they are and how they function um, as of, at least in theory, because we only have two in practice. Okay. The, on elections, how often do sheriffs get ousted prior to this law? Um, well, um, I believe their terms are, gosh, I should know this. Um, I believe they're four years. I, I, I think it's four years, but if somebody knows for sure. Uh, Ms. Weiss, did you want to comment? Yes, I would. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I live in the town of Leesburg, and we've encountered a problem with the language and the statute. And the problem is that the definition of localities, and it's localities that are given the power to create these civilian review, review boards, the definition is cities and counties. It does not include the word towns. Even though in other parts of the statute, it says that town police departments can be overseen by civilian oversight boards. So, the town attorney for Leesburg, and he's told me that he's spoken to other town attorneys in Loudoun County, they believe that the language in the statute does not, because of the Dillon rule, grant towns the authority yeah. to create. Yeah, the, the, you, you, might, you might get around that. 
uh, by saying that because they mentioned towns other where in there, but yeah, that's a, that's a drafting problem. Definitely. I tried that. I even sent a letter to the town council and the town attorney because there's language at the beginning of the statute saying that the definitions in the statute are only applicable pretty much like if they make sense and he still disagreed with me and said that other town attorneys <laughs> do too. And the town council is yeah. obviously going to listen to him over me. Oh so yeah. Um, okay. Well, only hopefully, resolution is to get it amended. Uh, hopefully somebody will do that because, you know, um, I, 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 I don't, I don't like to, uh, uh, by the way, somebody did say sheriff is four years other than clerk. They said all constitutional officers are four years. And I think that is correct. Clerk is six years. Um, because the clerks are really used to be and still are really powerful in some jurisdictions. Uh, I see that Mr. Clement is not on the line. So I hope, um, I hope that is not because he didn't get the link and is just otherwise occupied. Uh, but Hyatt is online. And also we just had that good comment from Ms. Weiss. So thank you for that. And anybody else that if you want to speak, just make sure that uh, you keep hitting me with those chat so that I can see it because the window does scroll pretty quickly. Um, so uh, I, I think that the legislature often does not. Can I speak real quick? Certainly, Mr. Turner, if you want to unmute and if you are decent and want to turn on your video, you can do that too. Uh, we have reached the half hour mark. So David has posted the link for the CLE form. Uh, feel free to get it now, uh, or we will try and get it to you. Uh, Robert here, sorry, no video, but can I can unmute phone? So no. this is oh you oh I see you're you're all you're not I'm on, on video. camera now. All right, oh, just, okay. just no, no, I, I think that was from Mr. Clement. Okay, all okay, right. uh, Mr. Turner, go ahead. Yeah, just to Mr. Weiss's point, I think there's a number of jurisdictions that are looking to sort of have some changes made to legislation, so she should consider consulting with other jurisdictions. I live in Arlington. I am involved in Arlington County's effort on surveying review boards. That's why I'm sort of somewhat informed about these issues. Um, and so we don't have the same concern or challenge that she has as a town. We're obviously a county, the county board, the county manager are very much being proactive in this effort, even before the legislation came out. Um, all in the wake of the George Floyd um, issues and protests. Uh, so um, I, I think there was going to be a number of issues in, in addition to the issue about the sheriff, which may be a challenge, as you mentioned, but a number of issues that need to be addressed um, uh, in the legislation. So I think Ms. Weiss would be wise to jump on board with other jurisdictions about what concerns they have. I, I'm just curious, uh, Mr. Turner, you seem to be fairly honest with us. What do you think about my question? Is this going to encourage or curb? civil litigation against police departments? Is this going to give us an opportunity to voice our concerns without having to, to go through the expense of a, of, a, of a 1983 action? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. So we are, so this is relatively new to Virginia, but they've been around in the country for decades. Um, uh, we live just outside of DC. DC has a pretty robust civilian review uh, activity. Uh, New York, City has pretty robust. I don't know if you've seen the New York Times article recently, though, that talked about how that uh, its program is not as effective as they would hope. Uh, but to address your question directly, um, it's not designed to curb litigation. It's designed. It's designed to redress uh, what is perceived to be perceived be perceived wrongs. Um, and so it's not going to be there in lieu of litigation. Um, and, and at this point in time, as I think, you know, without this sort of mechanism, all they have is litigation. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's not designed to do that. I can't say whether it will. Uh, and I anticipate savvy lawyers will say, hey, you know what, if we can get a finding from the Civil Review Board that helps us, that will help us litigation as well. So I wouldn't hold my breath and say, hey, it's going to help her <laughs> litigation. Well, actually, uh, what I was thinking was it might actually, and I guess encourage might not be the right word there, but, but as you say, if you have a civilian review board looking at something uh, I, and, and, and coming up with a, with a, uh, a finding in favor of the, uh, of the complainant, I would hope, number one, that would encourage the government to perhaps uh, want to avoid litigation, come forward with a settlement. 
but more to the point, um, as I said, I mean, one of the problems that I think a lot of people encounter is there just aren't enough lawyers, um, uh, that, uh, that will take on a 1983 action. Uh, you know, I mean, unless it's, unless they're already doing it pro bono through a, through a law group or something like that, because it's very expensive, uh, you know, federal court or even a, even a state court action, uh, which, which you can bring them in state court, uh, is it's, we, we have this access to justice problem and that's, that's a discussion for another day. Um, uh, but, uh, thank you for those comments. Let's, let's move on to the next one. I, I, I want to finish if we can, uh, but I also do not discourage comments. You know, the bar always says they would rather have people talking about this. Uh, so Bethany says, I wonder if the uh, woman from Leesburg who originally brought up this point has any opinions on whether this will lead to more or less litigation. So um, uh, if she wants to respond to that, I will, I will ask her to do so through, through text um, and, uh, and we'll move on. So uh, the second piece of legislation bans the police from executing no-knock search warrants. It will be effective March 1st of this year again, barring any change in the, uh, in the current legislative session. Uh, it's called Brianna Taylor Law. Brian, sorry, rented lips. Brianna's, <laughs> Brianna's Law after Brianna Taylor, who was shot and killed during a late night raid in Louisville. The legislation makes for just the third state in the country to bar police from executing warrants without first knocking and announcing themselves. Um, there, I do know that there are several other states that are considering it in their current legislative sessions, which a lot of states like Virginia begin in January. Uh, law enforcement agencies were divided on the measure with some arguing unannounced searches are important in limited circumstances to protect officers and preserve evidence, while others said they didn't use it, so it wasn't going to. Uh, uh, Proctor OneDrive needs a password to access the document. Um, the password should have been in the link. Um, yeah, it's 2020 special session exclamation point, no spaces. 2020 special session exclamation point, special and session are capitalized. So David, if you want to repost that, uh, and, uh, Mr. Turner, somebody, Mr. Smallwood is thanking you. And of course we thank you too. Um, so, uh, pretty straightforward piece of legislation. No more no-knock warrants. Uh, I understand that Mr. Clement is online, but he says he's got audio only. So if he has a comment and can unmute, or if Hyatt, you have something to say, we'll open the floor up. Um, I've only had one client who was, um, served with a no-knock warrant and, uh, I didn't think it was necessary in that situation. I think that um, I think that they may be asked for too much in some areas, and obviously, as stated earlier, they're not used in others. And so, I think that it's probably a good idea. I'd like to see, along with that, some sort of uh, repercussion for uh, executing a warrant on the wrong place. I think that is uh, a similar problem. Because if you have a citizen who is not engaged in criminal activity and their door gets broken down, um, certainly a no-knock warrant is the worst situation for both parties. Um, but I think it's also uh, something that legislature should consider as far as how to, how to compensate and redress uh, service on the wrong, wrong house, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, question. Uh does the state bar on no-knock warrants by federal law enforcement? No, it does not. They get their warrants from the federal court and no-knocks are still valid uh, in, in federal court. What is the penalty for police or the prosecution at trial if they break down the door anyway? Um, if they break it down without announcing, um, I think a state court, and, and you'll see why I say a state court in a minute, um, I think a state court would probably exclude the evidence if they knock it down after they announce, knock and announce, which uh, of course a lot of the, 
a lot of times the the space of time between knock and announce and forced entry is minimal. Uh, I think it would I think it would probably still be admitted. Um, in my forty, uh, so Robert is commenting by uh, 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 by chat. Uh, he says, in my 40 years of prosecution, I saw only one no-knock. Have others seen uh, very many? Um, as Hyatt said, he's only seen one uh, in his time. Uh, I think they're more common in urban jurisdictions, um, which, of course, Lunenburg County is is not. <laughs> um, so if anybody from an urban jurisdiction has... Uh, has some insight on that. Let's let's plenty in DC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Um, to address the issue, um, the last line before subsection C says any evidence obtained from a search warrant in violation of the subsection shall not be admitted into evidence for the Commonwealth in any prosecution. What I think is interesting is I can see courts reading that to say, well, the warrant has to say it's no knock. For the warrant to be invalid, so I I sort of take the opposite position. I'd be surprised if a state court judge suppressed evidence if a standard warrant was executed without knocking. Um, but that's I've seen a lot of judges work hard to incorporate evidence rather than exclude it. So uh, absolutely, absolutely, uh, and it's obviously going to be a question for the. Uh, for the uh, uh, Court of Appeals and eventually the Supreme Court. Um, so uh, Ms. Weiss, by the way, has, has responded to Bethany's question about uh, uh, litigation. And she makes the, the very valid point that even with a finding from a review board, going back to our last topic, uh, the police may still be entitled to, to qualified immunity, um, which is, which, is certainly true. Um, uh, I think I think a finding of abuse of, of uh, authority by a civilian review board might uh, get you around qualified immunity. But uh, as as Hyatt, I'm sure will tell you what you think a court will do and what they wind up doing. It's not always the same thing. <laughs> I'm sure many of you have said that. And I also uh, think that the citizen review boards. Um, and I'm sorry, John, if I cut you off. Um, yeah. I think the citizen review boards will be an interesting factor because part of qualified immunity is the notice that officers have that certain behavior is not appropriate or, or not permitted. Um, in my review and research on qualified immunity, that seems to be a big way that courts have dismissed these lawsuits is, well, officers didn't really have notice because the case wasn't, there wasn't a, a case that uh, demonstrated that. And so I think there, we might see this um, expand the type of behavior that officers are on notice of uh, the inappropriateness of their behavior. Okay, we have a comment that came in from email that I'd like to read. Uh, it says, I would suggest that we have members of this group living overseas answer the questions. If the group wants to support all VSB members living outside Virginia, this would be a good way to serve that mission. Well, we certainly encourage all members to participate and we want to hear from everybody. Um, and so I appreciate the comment, Mr. Falkenstein. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure though we have a way of identifying who is and who is not uh, um, in Virginia or in another state or overseas. We did have somebody contact us yesterday and say they live in Japan and they need to get their hours. And could we possibly do a, uh, courses at times more convenient to them uh, because they're 14 hours difference. And so we're looking at doing some late evening classes that would be better for them. And maybe what we can do is do uh, uh, special courses for our out of state people where they have a, a better opportunity to participate. Cause I do appreciate that with most of our participants being in state lawyers, they, they may feel crowded out, but, but we certainly are happy to have everybody here and welcome them. So if anybody wants to chime in from overseas or even just across the border, uh, <laughs> uh, let me know. 
Uh, oh, and uh, actually, uh, Mr. Cook is here from Tokyo. Hi. Um, sorry it's so late at night for you. What is there, about about 1.30 in the morning or something? <laughs> uh, anyway, what I said about the, uh, the federal warrants. Uh, so no-knock warrants were not that common in this country, obviously, uh, back in the good old bad old days when, when uh, getting the warrant was sort of a formality. But uh, in 1963, the Supreme Court first recognized that they might be proper. Uh, and there was a PBS NewsHour report, so everything on these next couple of slides comes from that, um, that said no-knock warrants were a product of the country of the war on drugs launched by President Nixon and gaining momentum under the 80s. But even then, even then, um, there were only about 1,500 such warrants issued nationwide, state and federal, uh, in the, into the late 20th century. Then uh, what happened was, in uh, that should say five to four, not five to one. Ah, I got my own typo. Uh, in Hudson versus Michigan, the court, uh, held that illegal forced entry was not subject to suppression. And the use of no-knock warrants, uh, which are, of course, legal forced entry, suddenly exploded to about sixty to 70,000 per year in the last decade. Um, it looks like somebody's actually posted, Ms. Holmes has posted a link uh, to a report uh, that supports that. Uh, we do have many of our magistrates online uh, and one of them has come. By the way, we should welcome them. Thank you for being here. Um, we're glad you're here uh, and uh, can't get password to work for the certificate. Uh, we will be sending the, the form out by email. So if you can't get it from the download link, uh, hopefully you'll get it by the email. If not, please contact us and we will definitely make sure you get it. Uh, so welcome to our magistrates. Uh, they did contact us early when we announced this saying, can magistrates attend? And we're, of course, happy. Those of them that are lawyers, those of them that are uh, former law enforcement or periodical. But let me read this. It says, as a magistrate, we are not permitted to include verbiage for how a search warrant is executed, nor are we involved in such execution as that falls on the law enforcement agency. Does that also apply to search warrants issued by a judge or no? Um Hyatt, you might be better qualified to answer that. I think a judge can probably put anything in the warrant he wants to. I think so too. Yeah. Um, I, I can't think of a time I've had a warrant issued by a judge rather than a magistrate, but it's not, it's not common down here. Yeah. Um, uh, I know I judge Lilly that. has told me that maybe in, in his 20 years on the bench, he issued maybe five, <laughs> But it's probably a lot more common in the urban areas, I would think, where they where they have more judges and more access to them. Uh, but it does mainly fall on the magistrates. And it's interesting, she says, they're not permitted to include the language of how the search warrant is executed, uh, which I find interesting because uh, that then sort of brings up the whole question uh, that Hyatt had about uh, the language in there saying that if, if the warrant required it, so... All right. Um, so uh, I think we've probably covered all of these uh, things. Uh, one thing that I will mention, Virginia does not have a stand your ground law, but in uh, states where they have them, uh, some people have pointed out that they're sort of in conflict because uh, technically if somebody's breaking into your house in those states, you can just blast away. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't want to be a police officer executing a no-knock warrant in one of those states. Uh, and I think that was a pretty intense discussion. Knock, knock. Who was there? Interrupting physicist. Interrupting physicist. Me on. <laughs> so I thought we needed to lighten the mood there a little bit with Big Bang Theory. If you're not a Big Bang Theory fan, I apologize. Uh, the third piece of legislation, and we are coming up um, on uh, about nine minutes to our hour mark. So if you need to, to round up and leave us, you can get your hour now. Um, but of course, we hope you'll stay until the until the end. And we are way behind schedule, but that's good. Uh, downgrading a handful of minor traffic violations to secondary offenses. Also effective March 1st this year, barring any change in this current legislative session. This was certainly the most widely uh, uh, talked about piece of legislation. I, I don't think there was any question. People were... 
really, really uh, perturbed by this, mainly because as it was originally written, it actually would not have allowed police to initiate a primary stop of the vehicle if they were driving with their headlights off uh, in, in pitch black darkness. Um, that was caught before the veto session uh, on the special session. It was changed and, uh, and they have amended it. But uh, the purpose of this obviously was to stop pretextual stops, uh, which uh, some people believe, and, and I'm not going to, uh, to gainsay them, um, can be made racially or, or otherwise motivated by improper uh, biases on the part of the police. Um, opponents uh, raised safety concerns, noting, as I mentioned, that initially passed that it wouldn't have allowed uh, an officer to stop somebody who was driving with their headlights off in total darkness. Um, they uh, did get it fixed, as I mentioned. So uh, a lot of discussion on this already has gone on in the, in the media and the legal community. Um, Hyatt or, or uh, Robert, if either one of you has a comment, um, or if anybody else wants to chime in. I'm, I'm happy with the legislation. I've <laughs> seen a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people pulled over for things that you wonder why. And the only explanation is the officer had a hunch, uh, about some other, uh, issue. And since a hunch is not sufficient, um, they have that to fall back on. I actually had a client a couple of years ago who was uh, convicted of armed robbery. And uh, the only way that the case went forward was uh, the Commonwealth attorney and the defense attorneys, because it was a multiple defendant case, watched the video un until the Commonwealth attorney could find a legitimate reason for the stop. And it was a, a dim or, or missing head tail light one of the two brake lights, I think it is what it was. Um, but it's, it's good to see that, that things like that aren't going to ultimately result in, um, in severe consequences for the client. Uh, so somebody's, what about the uh, driving behavior used as PC? Um, Ms. Havener saying, in your case, that they found the reason for the stop ex post facto. I was going to ask that same question. The officer didn't say why he stopped the car? So my understanding, if I remember correctly from my research, and this was a couple of years ago, is that the officer doesn't have to be aware of the reasonable suspicion. That if there's an huh. objective violation, that even if the officer was, was mistaken about why he did the stop, if there's an objective basis, that that is... <laughs> That's okay. And the comment, the comment that just came in was that's absurd. <laughs> right. I, I agree. Followed, followed, but very quickly by agree. Uh, <laughs> yes. I, I um, agree. Yeah. I don't recall that ever having been argued in the, in an appellate case that I've been involved in, but uh, that, yeah, I, I find that to be absurd. Um, we got another question about DUI. Um we, we should be clear that if the officer sees an actual violation in driving, like crossing the double yellow, uh, not, not signaling a turn, uh, speeding, obviously, any, anything that, that is still a legitimate basis for issuing a citation, that the list of things that are no longer primary offenses uh, is very specific, and it does deal primarily with uh, equipment issues uh, loud mufflers, that sort of thing. By the way, I should mention that um, all of the legislation is included in the appendix to your material. So if you want to see uh, 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 <clears throat> the specifics of any piece of legislation, uh, you can go there. Um, so, of course, one of the questions I had, uh, Robert says, uh, uh, Judge's decision will be upheld even if right, even though he does not state the correct basis. Yeah, that's, that is true. Uh, and not just for this, but for a lot of things. I trust we've all seen some situations escalate per, pretty rapidly when some people have asked why they were being pulled over for no apparent reason. Um, I certainly have. Um, uh, 
so the new distracted driving law, I think, is going to become sort of the new go-to basis for stopping somebody. And the important thing there is uh, any activity that looks like you are holding a handheld device uh, from the officer's perspective will be sufficient for him to initiate the stop, him or her. Um, and uh, um, so I think that that if if the real concern here uh, is to stop pretextual stops based on bias, I don't think it's going to be successful. And my reasoning is, if you decide to stop somebody for some reason that's improper, whether whether it's their race or you don't like the model of car they're driving or you know whatever, um, oh, and I've missed oh miss. Miss Holman has now spotted something. Are there? Yes. Uh. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you win. You win a Cupid doll. Um, I better not say that. So they'll probably ask me for a Cupid doll. So when would someone with faulty equipment ever be fined or prompted to fix it if police can't stop someone for this issue? The answer is that uh, they can write you up for anything once they've legitimately stopped you. Uh, and if you give the officer a hard time, you will get written up for your tinted windows and your muffler and your busted taillight and so on and so forth. Um, another question that, uh, that I saw someone ask is, if they think that the equipment uh, is an actual danger, can they do a community caretaker stop? In other words, if they think that your, your broken taillights are putting you at risk of getting rear-ended, uh, can they do a community caretaker stop? I don't so, think so. Um, I, I, I wouldn't put it past them trying, and I wouldn't put it past some judges saying, yeah, that was okay. I agree with you. But I think, <laughs> that, I think that the law would be no. Um, they can also cite you where you're parked, so all you need to do is park your car out front of your house. Uh, hi, did, do, do you understand that comment? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what IIRC is. But, but why would parking in front of your house uh, uh, solve that is what I'm, <laughs> if I recall correctly. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, let's move on to, to uh, we've got 30 minutes left and, and, uh, and 12 more to get through. In fact, uh, I was hoping to be at our break about 10 minutes ago. Uh, so uh, they're now prohibited from initiating a search of a vehicle based solely on the smell of marijuana, also a March 1st start date. Um, the searches were difficult to challenge because unlike uh, the, uh, the smell of alcohol that persists, when you roll down the windows, the smoke floats away pretty quickly. Um, although I, I think some officers would say, I can still smell it. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think a lot of this legislation is probably going to be mooted if they, uh, if they decide to go ahead and fully legalize recreational use of marijuana in this session. So I'm not sure that this is, is all that important a thing. Uh, one question I did have, and I'd like to, to see some comments on, is if anybody has any idea uh, uh, that uh, how, even if marijuana is made legal, just like alcohol, uh, you can still be under the influence uh, when driving of marijuana. So um, I, I just think that there's going to be some some issues where uh, the officer is going to, to want you to perform sobriety tests based upon uh, your driving. Uh, but I guess they're not going to be able to search the vehicle unless they uh, are able to place you under arrest and then do a search incident to arrest. Um, but if there's any comment on that, otherwise we'll move on. Colorado is suffering with DUID now and having to figure it out. Uh, okay, so that's good. Uh, I guess Virginia will have to figure it out too. Uh, 
another uh, reform that got quite a lot of uh, talking points going uh, in, at least within the bar, I think it also made the, uh, the, the mainstream news as well, is reforming criminal sentencing to eliminate the so-called jury penalty. So giving the option of having a jury trial for guilt, but having the judge do the sentencing. Uh, just one of two states that allowed um, jury sentencing. Now, I know that a lot of people have said, and I'm one of them, that the jury sentence is actually only advisory. The, the judge uh, can suspend time. Of course, what he can't do is go above what the jury recommends. He or she can't do that. Uh, but I have rarely, if ever, encountered a jury verdict in which the court did not impose the sentence uh, handed down by the jury. Um, one of the uh, arguments for this was that the jury does not receive the sentencing guidelines. They don't, uh, obviously, because there's been no pre-sentence report at the time of the trial. And so they don't actually have the same information that the judge will have if they sentence later at a sentencing hearing. Um, so the uh, advocates predict this will force uh, prosecutors to be offer more lenient plea bargains. I would be interested to hear from Robert or any of our Commonwealth attorneys that are online if they think that is so. Uh, Hyatt, also, if you have any views on that. This was, this was the reform that I was happiest with um, because I've had dozens of cases that I personally thought no jury would convict my client, but I was also fully aware of the risks. And after conveying those risks to the client, um, they were willing to take not the best plea agreement. So uh, I guess my first step is I hope so. Um, so um, I, I understand the aspect of the law, and this was the only disappointment, was that uh, defense attorneys could opt for jury sentencing, but they had to decide 30 days in advance. Um, I wish it was once the guilty verdict was announced, then we could decide. <laughs> um, I was involved in a case where the jury's only question to the judge is, are you sure we can only give him 12 months? And so that would be a very... <laughs> A very concerning question if you had filed the notice 30 days before yeah. um, that you wanted the jury sentencing. But um, I think this is going to do a lot to help the process because um, it, it's going to, I think, hold the whole system accountable. Um, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and judges, everyone involved, I think, are going to put a little bit more thought into cases because, um, at least at, at the guilt or innocence, uh, because juries are now more accessible. And I, I thought- we, was, Yeah, we had a comment, reason for a July 1st start date of this legislation versus March. Um, I don't know for a fact why some were, were done in March, some were done in July, but my guess would be that the July start dates were for legislation that they anticipated being changed in the upcoming session, which would also start July 1st. But uh, as to why the legislature did that, and some of them even have later start dates into uh, 2022 and beyond. Um, another comment is the grand jury process and jury trial processes are the input from private citizens. And that's certainly the view that I often hear expressed by uh, circuit court judges when, when they're asked to consider suspending time from a jury sentence and their response is, you know, um, this is what the citizens think is appropriate. And so that's what I'm giving. Uh, from a broader view, this comment from, from uh, Robert, why do defendants prefer jury over judge? Obviously because the jury will be more likely to get confused and have an agenda, et cetera. On the other hand, why did prosecutors prefer juries occasionally because generally they would get a harsher sentence? Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, I mentioned, uh, and Hyatt knows that Judge Lilly and I uh, were, were office mates for a while, or we shared adjoining offices. Uh, Judge Lilly would always uh, occasionally talk about, uh, he'd see about a case in the news, and he'd say, you know, he used to be a defense attorney. He said, I think I'll take a jury on that one, uh, because he, what he meant was that the facts of the case were so uh, beneficial to the defendant. Like, like the father that, that sees the man 
molesting his six-year-old daughter and beats the crap out of him and then gets charged with, uh, with uh, assault and battery. He said, I'll take a jury on that one, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, there, there, the, the, Hyatt, I think you were saying, do you think this is going to make the, the, the decision to go for a jury sentencing easier? Or I, I wasn't quite sure that I, I kind of interrupted you there. To go to a uh, jury sentencing or a jury trial? Jury trial, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Um, in other words, in other words, yeah. I, I'll, I'll go for the jury and hope they see it my way. But if not, I'll still get the judge to, uh, to consider mitigating factors. And the, right. and the guidelines. Yeah. Uh, and, will it now be malpractice if a defense attorney does not insist that his client take a jury trial? I don't think so. And I'll, I'll respond to that by saying uh, in celebrating this change with some friends of mine, uh, they pointed out that judges in their jurisdictions still sentence more harshly on a jury conviction. Um, they feel like, you know, the defendant uh, asked for community input and the input was that he was guilty and, you know, so, but I don't think it's gonna be the four year distinction, I think is the statistic I saw that defendants who get convicted in a jury trial get four years more on average than a defendant who goes to a bench trial. Um, I also, to also answer the question from the defense perspective on why I'd rather have a jury. Sometimes it's like John mentioned where the facts are so favorable that a jury would uh, acquit. Another one is a diversity of viewpoints. Um, obviously, we all know that every case can be viewed from more than one perspective. And so to have 12 people's perspective on a case, um, evaluating whether there's guilt or innocence beyond a reasonable doubt, as well as the diversity of how people interpret beyond a reasonable doubt, um, that is also important. Um, and so I think that the jury getting confused, I'm not really going to place my bet on. Um, I think that at least in our area, our prosecutors are good enough that they're going to clarify things that I'm trying to maybe muddy the waters on, but it's much more about having uh, diversity of viewpoints. And, um, I think judges are well aware of the techniques to, interpret the law um, in, a, in a direction that takes the case where the judge uh, feels like it should go good or bad for, for my side, where I think if it's more of a, um, a plain language kind of argument that I wanna make, I don't think a jury is going to uh, be as creative with how they interpret the jury instructions as a judge might be. Yeah, a couple of, couple of quick comments actually. Going back to our first thing, uh, police misconduct charges always take a bench trial, and then somebody says, why? Um, I think that's a jurisdictional thing. I think there are some jurisdictions where you absolutely do not want a jury trial for, for a civil case of police misconduct. Um, I think probably with, with events of recent, uh, the recent months and, and years, uh, it's probably becoming more likely that juries will not necessarily defer to police officers, but there are certainly jurisdictions where, where uh, a jury trial for a, a police misconduct would not be my, my favorite, but I, but I understand both viewpoints. Uh, I did mention uh, that one attorney uh, that I know of has already um, asked a circuit court to delay for, de for a, uh, a continuance until after July 1st because they want a jury trial, but they don't want jury sentencing. I haven't heard whether the judge uh, went along with that. I suggested he might want to come up with a different reason for a continuance, but uh, uh, I was thinking the he, same thing. He, he was he he was he was honest enough to say, "No, I, I have to be honest with the tribunal, and that's why I want the continuance." Uh, so give him give him that. Um, um, so uh, moving on again, oh gosh, we've got about 19 minutes. So we're gonna pick up the pace here a little bit. Uh, creating Virginia's first statewide code of conduct for police officers. Um, of course, previously there was none. Um, and uh, they were uh, adopted by the individual departments and they varied quite widely. Uh, 
Somebody says, do you agree with the host perspective that it depends on the jurisdiction and the potential jury pool? Uh, that was in response to a comment that judges are more conscious of police officers' state of mind, so they almost always acquit. Um, hmm. Those are some interesting points. Uh, I wish we had more time to discuss them. <laughs> Um, the bill was backed by advocates for reform and police groups. So there was, there was sort of a unanimity of agreement here. Um, and the Criminal Justice Services Board will adopt the statewide standards. Uh, and among other things, they will define what constitutes serious misconduct. Um, and uh, to stop what police chief said had been a common practice of officers resigning while they're under investigation and taking a job at another department, uh, they, uh, they now have to uh, record those instances and, and report them. Um, so one of the things about this and, and a couple of these pieces of legislation that we did hear from some people was, this was the state trying to impose uh, its view of things on localities and taking away the authority from the, the localities. Now, of course, we all know Virginia is a Dillon rule state. So in theory, uh, they have no power that the state doesn't give them to begin with. But in practice, uh, a lot of localities have uh, uh, been given a great deal of leeway in, the, in how they operate the, their day-to-day -day business. Um, and so some people are saying that, well, the Democrats are in power now. They're going to centralize more power in Richmond. Others are saying, oh, can you share the House bill number on this one again? Um, let me see if I can go back and get that because it is. Um, this, that should be in your, in your material, but uh, uh, come on. Here we go. Uh, it's HB 51009. Uh, but that, that is in your material, if you have the written material. Um, so I'm not going to say any more about that. Uh, that's obviously a political discussion, and we try to stay non-political here. Uh, but it's certainly possible that, that uh, that's a valid criticism, uh, that there's just a different philosophy of uh, where the answers lie best, locally or at the state level. Um, Anybody wants to chime in on that one? Uh, otherwise, we'll move on. Uh, 16 minutes here to go. Mandating racial bias, de-escalation, and crisis intervention training for police. Again, this is to establish statewide standards. Um, and uh, it will take uh, quite some time to, to implement, um, obviously, getting the courses together and that sort of thing. Uh, it, uh, there is a companion bill that expands the membership of the committee that will create the new standards to include representatives from minority social justice and mental health organizations. Uh, a lot of experts qu question the effectiveness of anti-bias training, saying it cannot change the attitudes of overtly biased individuals and is ineffective in helping others recognize unconscious bias in their behavior. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree with that second point. I think that if you are, if you can be made to recognize uh, your own behavior that you don't realize is being perceived and may actually be biased, uh, I think you can learn to avoid it or at least learn to recognize it when it's there. I do agree with the first statement. Uh, I, I think it is very hard for someone who has a lifelong bias against minority, against gender, against nationality, against religion, whatever. Uh, it's just very hard uh, to, to, to help them see that. And of course, we do see these occasional uh, feel-good stories about the, the former member of the, of the KKK or whatever who... who um, becomes enlightened, but I, I don't know that it's, somebody says it requires a willingness to change. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I've conducted training for many uh, levels of law enforcement. You can order people to change behavior, but you can't order people to change their minds. Those who don't agree will just turn off. Um, and uh, 
you know, uh, so I, I'm not saying that, that that makes these programs ineffective. Uh, it certainly helps with, with the subsequent review of activity to be able to say, well, you took this course and yet you still thought that this was okay. How, how is that possible? Uh, they also have created a mental health crisis response teams. Uh, this is something that has not been used a lot in Virginia. The idea of having these community-based teams of experts from uh, other uh, uh, professions to assist the police in, uh, I have received comments from officers who have now recognized the issue and intended change. Well, that's good. That's from uh, uh, Robert, who uh, uh, Commonwealth's attorneys, I'm sure, hear from police more than and defense attorneys do. Um, this is effective July 1st. Again, it's going to require um, the formation of these intended versus actual change. Any follow-up on this uh, is a comment to Mr. Turner from Robert. Um, I think intentions are always good. I agree that sometimes uh, they do not result in actual change. For example, I have intended to lose weight for quite a number of years now and I have my upcoming uh, uh, annual physical next week, and I'm not sure the doctor is going to be happy with me. So, Mr. Turner, you make an excellent point that we really have to uh, implement the change, not just intend to. Uh, this is named the Marcus Alert after a 24-year-old shot and killed by a Richmond police officer during a mental health crisis. The bill establishes a response team around the state specialized in mental health issues. Uh, and uh, the, there's a comment here, I was going to actually mention that case of a 16-year-old child who uh, uh, the police um, actually were uh, sort of sitting on him, crushing him to try and get him under control. And as the father of an autistic adult uh, child, I can tell you that that's probably not the best response. And that, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that was down in Louisiana where that young man died. Uh, so a very tragic case there. Um, I have two comments and a question. Okay. Um, so I, I think that this is a good step in the right direction. I've had many clients who have family members who come to me and say, you know, I called the police because I wanted help and they ended up arresting my son, brother, sister, whoever. Um, and, you know, the first time I heard that I was, my reaction in uh, my mind was, um, well, when you call the police, you should expect whoever you're calling the police about to get arrested. And I, I disagree with that original thought um, from many years ago. You should be able to call the police and get more help than just an arrest. And so I'm hoping to see this uh, go in that direction. I also think that expanding the use of mental health courts is going to be a good or necessary uh, attachment to this because if police don't address the mental health issue um, on the mental health side versus the criminal uh, side, then I think the courts can be a backstop to that um, either while they're getting training or outside the heat of the moment, uh, they can, the courts can address the mental health issue. Uh, that's the primary concern. The question I have for you, John, is do you think that this is going to go back or, or be similar to when special justices would go out with the police on mental health calls? Um, I think it's, it's going to be more than that. Uh, as I understand that these teams are, are uh, uh, dispatched. I, I looked at some of this online where they're doing it in other places and they have, they're almost like um, uh, the vehicles they go in are almost like ambulances. Um, and they have, they have lots of, of uh, resources that are immediately available to them. Obviously, one of the problems is, is that there are not going to be very many of these teams. I believe I, I, it says up there there are five regional teams. So they're not going to be very many of them. Uh, and they're only going to be called in for serious, like, standoff situations or, or uh, something like that. So the typical call that comes in where, where a family member or uh, just someone, you know, in public is having some type of a mental health crisis, uh, it's still going to be the police. And so uh, uh, 
uh, I think that the, the, the issue here again is, uh, is it fair to make our police also our mental health counselors? Uh, I, I certainly understand police officers who say that's not what I've been trained for and, and I can't be expected to do this. One of the things is, is that there are resources in the community available that the police need to be made aware of. Crisis hotlines and temporary uh, uh, shelters, respite shelters and that sort of thing. Um, we've got a lot of comments coming in here and I'm, and I'm not, I'm hoping to get them, uh, but, but as I say, if, if, uh, if they've scrolled past, I'll try and do that. So. Uh, somebody says training is helpful, not a panacea. So referring back to our last section, um, the response of law enforcement in the events in DC is unmistakably different than the response we saw during peaceful protests this summer. And uh, that is a valid point that has been raised by many. Uh, mental health dockets are for misdemeanors, uh, which of course is uh, uh, true. Mental health courts are a great idea, but having access to mental health care in the first place would be much better, absolutely. Uh, former assistant prosecutor and defense attorney, the police are asked to do too much. Something I just said. Uh, they, they are asked to respond to things they have no training to handle. And there is a uh, shock about, and then there is shock about the results. Yeah. Uh, very lengthy comment from here from Ms. Warren. National Alliance of Mental Health has been tra conducting training for officers for years on a voluntary basis. 911 operators should be trained to request the civilian intervention team trained officer or uh, uh, crisis, I'm sorry, crisis intervention uh, trained officer. Um, that's probably a very good suggestion, yeah. Advocacy groups recommend not calling the police and mental health authority, but calling social services. It's been very difficult for families of the mentally ill to get properly trained in intervention. Uh, we need to stigmatize this issue, absolutely. Uh, Social workers come in once the scene is secure and that's the sticky time, says somebody. Uh, when they're, that's saying when they're, when they're involving the, ish, the uh, serving of search or arrest warrants, the counselors come in after the scene is secure. If they are physically attacked, even by an autistic individual, they will respond at the moment, absolutely. Um, Wow, lots of comments on this one. We probably could do a whole CLE based on the number of comments coming in. I apologize for not being able to get to everybody. Uh, I hope that you are seeing these comments on your screen. We've got six minutes left, so let's uh, let's keep moving here if we can. We've got we're not even halfway yet. Um, uh, so we've pretty much covered all of that. Um, this legislation, of course, uh, limiting or uh, 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 the use of chokeholds or other types of uh, restraints that can cut off uh, the airway. Uh, they would be subject to administrative decertification. Uh, the impact will have as a subject of ongoing debate. A related bill requires officers to intervene if they see a colleague engaged in unlawful or excessive force and also subjects them to disciplinary sanctions, sanctions if they don't. Uh, we obviously all know that this came uh, as a result of um, the, uh, the incident in Minneapolis and uh, other similar ones across the country. Um, is it a permanent administrative decertification? Yes, that is my understanding, uh, that, that an officer who violates this law and is found to have violated it will be uh, not eligible to be hired um, at least in the state of Virginia. Uh, one of the uh, delegates actually pushed for uh, criminal penalties and another said that uh, he was actually opposed to it uh, because he thought it would uh, uh, possibly subject the officers to prosecution under the strangulation statute. Uh, decertification across state lines, I, I honestly have no idea whether, whether there is some type of national network. I have certainly heard stories of officers moving from state to state uh, to, to avoid uh, uh, the consequences of their, of their prior uh, disciplinary issues. Uh, this is where we actually were gonna meet our, uh, uh, our, our uh, 
midpoint, but we're actually three minutes away from being out of time. Yeah, yeah, the song went okay. I was a little flat tonight. My grandfather will disown me after that performance. Said, Ma, I'm telling you, not tonight. I don't want any more conditions. Then he called me and I said, no way, mister. I'm telling you, Soda always kicks me when she high steps. Uh, 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 guys, can you just pipe down? The, the film's about to start. Oh, really? Yeah, the audience can hear you on your phones. Sorry, everybody, I guess we should all... Go to the lobby? Now that is a very good idea. Okay, so I apologize for us. We had some very good uh, conversations. Um, and uh, uh, somebody says, can we do a CLE to cover the half we didn't get to? Well, we're actually going to finish. You don't have to stay online for that, but I will go through the rest of these. We will move very quickly, though. I, I realize people probably want to get on with their holiday or their work or whatever. Uh, and you do have access to all of the materials and the PowerPoint, uh, and you do get the hour and a half credit. Unfortunately, we can't give you longer credit. Bar won't let us do this. This probably should have been a two-hour CLE. Uh, uh, there is a, a comment here about whether or not police can move to another state. There has been a call for a national database to track bad actors, but I assume that means there isn't one. Uh, so very quickly before we move on, I'll just say... Um, if you haven't been able to download the CLE, and I understand the uh, CLE attendance form, I understand some people have had some problems with that. Uh, do look for that email. If you don't get the email, uh, contact us. Uh, we have had very good luck with uh, confirming that people have attended. We've had less good luck with the emails getting through to them. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and move <clears throat> on. And as I said, uh, at the beginning, uh, some of these were criminal justice reform in the sense of policing. Uh, the second half, these are mostly about the, the post-policing phase, the, uh, the uh, uh, penal phase, if you will. So the first one was giving inmates a chance to earn early release dates. Uh, this was very controversial. Uh, it finally passed only after the uh, sponsors agreed to have a large list of crimes included that were not eligible for gaining early release through these uh, uh, programs. So um, uh, they would have to follow prison rules so they could get no infractions. They have to participate in counseling and education programs. Uh, but if they do this, it's not, it's not parole, it's actually early release. Uh, they would still be subject to uh, uh, fulfilling their sentences if there was any suspended time, that sort of thing. Uh, somebody says, would love to see CLE focused on mental health courts. Um, so maybe we'll see if we can't put something like that together. Uh, at the time the, the legislation was introduced, they said it would possibly move up the date of up to 14,000 inmates uh, helping to deal with uh, uh, prison overcrowding as well as uh, uh, reducing the cost of that. So that was one of the things that uh, that some of the legislators actually thought was was uh, beneficial. Um, I think it's since we've abolished parole in Virginia, I think uh, this is actually a good plan. Um, without the possibility of early release, a lot of prisoners, I think, do not uh, uh, think that they need to use their time to improve themselves. And if the programs are available, and I understand that often they aren't, but if the programs are available, I think uh, encouraging them to take advantage of them in this way is a good thing. Um, any comments uh, or we'll just move on? Okay. Um, as I mentioned, it was, uh, it was controversial passing on a party line vote and only winning a majority by adding that long list of uh, excluded cases. There is a related bill that expands compassionate release policies, uh, which had been among the most restrictive in the country. Uh, a lot of that did have to do with the COVID outbreak and a lot of our geriatric patients died uh, as a result of contracting COVID in, a, in an isolated uh, uh, situation where there was uh, the uh, Deerfield Correctional Center had a, a massive, massive outbreak and a number of vulnerable inmates were killed. And I think that was uh, uh, the reason for that. Uh, Imposing modest limits on military equipment available to law enforcement. Uh, the term modest was uh, <laughs> uh, 
perhaps a little bit controversial because of the things that they that they were no longer allowed to take it. I was surprised to find that they could have them. Uh, weaponized drones, combat aircraft, grenades and grenade launchers, mine resistant armored vehicles, bayonets, tanks, <laughs> and 50 caliber or higher weaponry. Uh, I don't consider eliminating those modest, but okay. Um, the, the one issue there that was controversial was the motorized vehicles, which police said, you know, we actually find those to be useful, uh, in rescue situations. Uh, but there is a provision in the law that allows them to apply for a waiver. So if in fact, those, those vehicles have a legitimate use, um, they can get them. Uh, but, uh, I think the one that actually surprised me was bayonets. Um, I, I can't imagine a situation in which the police would need to use bayonets. If you're, if you're not able to contain a crowd with shields and batons and that sort of thing, I'm not sure bayonets is the way to go. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm more for, if it reaches that point, I think the rules of engagement should allow use of a, a of a type of force that you don't have to be right up front and personal. And a bayonet is absolutely uh, up front and personal. So, um, you know, um, if there are any law enforcement people out there that have comments on, uh, on that, uh, please chime in. Uh, one of the questions, of course, that came up was given what happened in the nation's capital just last week, uh, is it possible that police may need these kinds of of uh, materials. Uh, again, I'm not seeing comments coming in. I'm guessing most people just want us to, to finish up here. Uh, local prosecutors have the authority to dismiss whatever case they want. Uh, I actually am in the camp that said, I always thought that was the case. I know some judges were, were interpreting it as otherwise, but uh, um, I agree with those who said that this was simply affirming the existence of a power that already existed. Um, the discussion point here, of course, is whether or not uh, this legislation, now that it is actually enshrined in the law, does that suggest that the ultimate power to dismiss a criminal case for mercy rests with the Commonwealth? And you'll recall Moreau versus Fuller, uh, that was about delaying disposition and dismissing uh, on terms. Uh, there was a, a big push in the legislature to say that courts do not have that power unless it's specifically uh, listed in the statute. Uh, the, the court was uh, uh, split about, uh, there were three opinions, although the, 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 the ultimate decision was agreed on by everyone, which was that there is no writ of mandamus to compel a judge to impose sentence. Uh, but the reasons varied from uh, it's not a ministerial act, and so mandamus doesn't lie, even though we don't think the judge has that power. Two, how can the judge not have that power? How, how can you take away the element of mercy? Um, so I, I don't know that this statute will uh, affect that analysis. I, I'm not sure how it's going to come up because of uh, it would have to be raised on a direct appeal. Uh, thank you for finishing. The info is very helpful, even if to see CLA for overage. Uh, that's why we do it. Um, any comments on that? Um, making it a hate crime to make a false 911 call motivated by race or other bias. Of course, that's what we call swatting. Uh, it's called the Karen Act. Um, and it was originally uh, introduced in San Francisco. It I, I had to look this up to be sure. In fact, Karen, caution against racially exploitative non-emergencies was intended to represent Karens. You know, the care, oh, there's a Karen uh, calling on the black family having a picnic or whatever. Uh, apparently they couldn't come up with a K word that fit into it. So they went with the C. Um, you know, the truth is though, a lot of these swatting things are not necessarily, uh, uh, okay, so somebody said here, a good example of using the, the uh, armored vehicle, district had an attempted murder and the suspect fled in a large U-Haul. Typical law enforcement e uh, vehicle could not do a safe pit maneuver with large vehicles and the, uh, the, the, the uh, 
uh, heavy military vehicle was safe for that. So, yeah. And, and as I said, they, they can apply for a waiver uh, to get those types of vehicles or, in fact, any military equipment. Um, I, I'm curious if any of our police forces have, have gotten uh, jet fighters because that was one of the things that was excluded. Um, I remember in, the, in the, uh, the movie, the Dan Aykroyd version of Dragnet, there's actually a scene where he's flying in an LAPD jet fighter to chase down the, the villain who's escaping in a private plane. But uh, anyway, uh, swatting is a federal crime in some instances, but one of the things is a lot of swatting, in fact, most of them uh, are not racially motivated. They are intended to, uh, isn't it more often just a teenager on the internet kind of thing? Absolutely. Uh, so while obviously if, if you can prove racial motivation, if there was a deliberate attempt to try and get someone harmed, uh, this statute would come into effect. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, it's just going to be <clears throat> a standard misuse of the uh, communication lines, misuse of uh, 911, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, so I'm not sure that this is a significant problem. At least I would hope that it's not. But uh, the uh, uh, authorizing the attorney general to investigate local police departments. Uh, this is one that, again, I was under the impression the attorney general could do that. I didn't know there needed to be authorizing legislation. Uh, it was introduced by Senator Lucas, uh, who uh, basically said it was in response to a lack of responsiveness by the Department of Justice uh, to look into claims of discrimination in terms of the, um, the departure of the black female police chief who said that she was the subject of discrimination. Um, so I think that two things that I would say about this, number one is with the change in presidential administration, I think the Department of Justice may, may be more responsive in future. And again, I don't think that the uh, attorney general uh, really needed the express authority to do this, but uh, now he has it if somebody thinks that they need to. Uh, some have said that he won't exercise the uh, power because of the deference to local policies. Um, and that's certainly a problem. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the CLE, we have this long tradition in Virginia of the state government uh, leaving internal uh, policy matters to the elected officials there, the constitutional officers, uh, of course, the one that's most common is when uh, there's a change in the clerk's office or a change in the Commonwealth Attorney's office, and the new incoming person cleans house. And it's it's you know pretty obvious to everybody that it's that it's for political reasons. But uh, traditionally, the the state government and the courts have said they're constitutional officers. It's 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 within their prerogative to do that. Um, I, I would like to think, however, that if the uh, uh, if there were serious allegations of racially biased hiring in a police department that the attorney general or the uh, civil rights division of the Department of Justice would look into it. Uh, another piece of legislation that did get uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, coverage was authorizing the state to inspect ICE facilities, specifically the Farmville Detention Facility, uh, after there was some uh, COVID outbreak there, so similar to the prison thing. Um, it is not clear whether the uh, Department of Homeland Security is actually going to allow these inspections. I do have a feeling that the, the incoming administration will likely be more favorable to that. Uh, and we're, I believe this is our last one. Yay! So we're only uh, 11 minutes over. The new legislation, which won... Uh, oh... <laughs> Did I miss the did I miss the opening slide on this one? Or uh, perhaps there isn't an opening slide on this one. Okay, there should have been an opening slide. This is one that I was I like like the new rule that says attorneys are not supposed to have sex with their clients. That's a new disciplinary rule if you're not aware of it. I was not aware that there was not a state law against officers having sexual relations with detainees. I was dumbfounded. And then to find out that there is there was no law in 34 other states. I was just dumbfounded to find is that really something that you that, I mean, maybe you maybe most people thought, well, you don't need a law for that. 
Um, so anyway, uh, effective uh, March 1st, uh, cops are, are, there is no such thing as a consensual relationship between an arresting officer and the detainee. Um, the, uh, the, the reason that is given most often for not adopting the law is they say it encourages false reports and the officers can't defend if, 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 the, if they say, uh, well, if it's a false report, if there was no contact, uh, hopefully you're going to, you're not going to have to claim it was consensual you know, it didn't happen. Uh, but that's the reason that's been given. So uh, that does get us to the end. Uh, so we did go over by 12 minutes. I apologize. And, and of course, obviously if we'd had, uh, the full half hour. I'm sure we would have discussed those last ones much longer, but you do get your full credit. Um, and thank you for participating. Do uh, look for that email if you if you weren't unable to download the CLE form and um, and don't get that email. Uh, contact us. The, the best way I think is probably to go to the website and use the contact us form because we definitely get those emails. Uh, we do have some difficulty with emails not getting through uh, that are coming to us. Don't know why that is. Um, I, I will tell you that the experience that I've had doing these online and having to communicate with email, it has really lowered my confidence in, in email. I, I used to think email was, was, you know, pretty much you sent it and the person got it. Um, I don't know that that's true anymore. Anyway, uh, I'm going to unshare the screen so that you can see my big, beautiful face. And um, Hyatt's too. <laughs> thank you, Hyatt. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you, everybody who chimed in either uh, vocally or. Um, uh, oh, somebody said, uh, somebody said, thank you for going over. They needed it to round up to the 1.5 hours. So, yeah, th there actually are benefits there. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Hey, Jen, good to see you again. Um, we'll stay online for a little while if anybody just wants to chat or, or talk about anything. Uh, will there be a chance to watch the recording? Um, you know, I had some people ask about that, uh, prior ones. Um, we do record these and, um, you know, if you'd like to rewatch it, um, the thing is the files are really big, so I don't know that they go on YouTube or something. Uh, but you know what, maybe in the, it may be in a post seminar, uh, uh, little questionnaire, I'll ask if people want to be able to watch the repeat, um, because, uh, it, we have gotten a couple of people, uh, to request that, uh, I'd particularly like to thank Hyatt for getting dressed up for this. Um, I don't know, since it's a holiday, you can't be going into court. No, I got uh, dressed up for this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well. You see, I, I was going to make some comment about the fact that the first one I did, I actually did wear a tie. And then I mm -hmm. thought, you know, that's silly. I haven't quite gotten to the point of not wearing pants just in case I have to stand up. Uh, <laughs> I'm wearing jeans. Uh, don't worry about not having the webcam uh, or microphone. Oh, he says he'll get one. Okay, good. Uh, by the way, Robert, you are going to be on the uh, on the the uh, steering committee for the for the conference. So, uh, uh, yeah, you might want to invest in a webcam and microphone since we'll probably be doing our meetings on uh, on Zoom. Uh, hi, you don't know this yet, but uh, uh, I'm going to volunteer you to be the 23rd Circuit representative on the steering committee. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I find I find people volunteer much more readily if you if you don't tell them until after right. you've actually volunteered them. No, oh, I I'm see Craig is there. online. Hey, Craig. Uh, Craig Leisure, who uh, who we occasionally see at our Wednesday lunch. Uh, let me mention very quickly: uh, we're about to put something else online on our uh, on our website. It's called Better Know a Circuit uh, with with uh, a little tip out to Stephen Colbert's. Colbert Rapport, uh, better know a district, his, his uh, occasional piece where he oh. would cover a congressional district. And what it's going to be, it's going to be a listing of all of the courthouses in the region 
with uh, contact information and uh, what we hope is also to have some local information like good places to eat, good places to stay if you have to stay overnight. Um, and uh, uh, so we'll be putting that up probably in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I've got the, all of the 10th circuit and I started on the 16th circuit. I'm doing it in, in numerical order. Uh, but I'll probably put it up before everything's up um, because um, one of the things that, that you often hear from people is I typed in the password and it's not working. Okay. Well, hopefully Ms. Scott, you'll get the email uh, that has the form attached to it. Uh, if you don't get the email, absolutely make sure that you contact us to get that CLE form. Don't forget. I'm willing to help out with the steering committee too. Yeah. Uh, you'll, you'll be our international representative. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we, have, uh, we have a couple of uh, VAA people from, I think, I'm trying to remember, Illinois and Florida that want to be on the steering committee, but we don't have anybody from, from overseas part of the time. Uh, so so, so uh, Dr. Fashans will be our, uh, our international representative. <laughs> um, Maybe we can get the guy from Japan too. Uh, the one thing, by the way, uh, uh, you get your registration fee and your hotel room covered, but we're not going to pay uh, to fly you from Japan or Germany or or even Florida. So, or to drive up from Roanoke, uh, you will have to provide your own transportation. Uh, Miss Avener says, check your spam folders for those emails. Absolutely, and please uh, uh, make the effort to add the VMVLA to your safe senders list. Uh, I think maybe one of the reasons that some of our emails get bounced is because um, once they start bouncing, if you don't add us to the safe sender list, the email server says, oh, well, that must actually be spam. You, you, you know, So you find it in your spam folder, you read it, you say, okay, fine, I've got it. But you don't add us to the safe sender list. They're going to just keep... Um, uh, she says, I did work as a diplomat, so travel is no problem, COVID notwithstanding. <laughs> uh, I was surprised at the content of the first 18 minutes of the seminar. I found it to be controversial and with a decidedly anti-Northam attitude. Oh, really? I thought I was actually coming off as pro. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I guess the part about the, the, the Supreme Court was. I was very turned off and would not participate again in a seminar that featured content like that. The rest of the seminar after this 18 minutes was appropriate. The CLE is not a forum to air or discuss Northam's actions. Um, okay, I appreciate your statement. I understand where you're coming from, uh, but I do think that there is some relevance uh, to discussing uh, how that session came about. But I appreciate, Ms. Schwartz, your comments. And uh, we do try and stay non-political. Uh, and of course, I did sort of acknowledge that it was getting to that point, and then tried to artfully dodge away. But I'm sorry that you uh, that you did not find it to be appropriate. Um, and I guarantee that uh, uh, we'll we'll stay away from that in the future. Most most of uh, most of our courses are not. We don't do that. And of course, I won't be presenting at most of the courses going forward. Um, we finally are able to get people <laughs> like Hyatt to agree to come online. Uh, the, the fall seminar, I did almost all of the courses except for two uh, because the people who had originally agreed to do them live weren't available. And uh, we didn't have time to, uh, to, to get people to fill in. But I do appreciate your comment, Ms. Schwartz, and I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry that if you felt it was inappropriate. Um, so I don't think we've got, uh, very many people left online. Uh, we're well, actually, we have 86, uh, uh, the whole Farmville thing from this summer is really much worse than most people think all of my clients that were there contracted COVID good heavens. You know, I was going to say something, uh, when we started doing these things online, I did not actually know anybody personally. Uh, who, who had contracted COVID. And in the intervening, I guess it's been what, about three months, November, or December, and, and almost halfway through January, so not even three months. Um, members of my family have contracted it. I know lawyers here in Roanoke who have, who have had it. It's gone through their whole families. Uh, uh, even a couple of people um, sort of in, not 
not close personal friends of mine, but people that I know who know people have died. So yeah, between November when I'm not saying things were, were not bad in November, but the escalation uh, has gotten really, really bad. Uh, knowing the rationale behind the legislation is important, not necessarily political. Well, uh, law is by nature political. We would be remiss to be completely apolitical. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's a, a fair point, um, that we want to try and avoid being partisan, but we do have to recognize the political nature of the lawmaking process. Uh, what, you know, one of the other things I'll say, and I think, hi, uh, you would agree with this. Sometimes talking about the personality of judges is not uh, bitching. Uh, it's it's saying, look, you need to know this is this is the judge that's not going to listen to you um, w- when you make this particular type of argument. He just doesn't, you know. Uh, there there's a there there was a story that I love uh, told by a, a Roanoke lawyer um, years ago. Uh, gosh, it's probably been twenty because it was. It was at least 25 years ago. Uh, the Court of Appeals came out with a decision called Untight, uh, which was basically saying there's a law that allows you to get the radar information in by getting around the hearsay problem. But if you're going to do that, you've got to follow the law exactly. There's no uh, 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 substantial compliance. And essentially all it was was you have to get two signatures on a piece of paper. That's all it was. Fill out a piece of paper, get two signatures on it, show it to the judge, the radar comes in. Don't have that, it doesn't. Uh, and so that was a without, you know, so a lot of traffic lawyers are like, yeah, we can we can start challenging these uh, certifications that aren't properly filled out. And uh, so one of those lawyers went to a general district court hearing in Botetourt County, and uh, and when the officer said I was operating the radar and so on and so forth, and he said, do you have the certification? The officer said, yes. And he asked him if it had the, the correct signatures on it to authenticate the copy. And the judge stopped him and, and said, uh, and Hyatt will know who I'm talking about, because the judge said, Mr. Walker, we don't, we don't say, you, you don't accuse an officer of lying in my courtroom. And he said, judge, I'm, I'm not saying he's lying. I just want to know if, the, if this form is an accurate copy and it has to, and the judge said, no, you're saying, he's saying it's not an accurate copy. You're saying he's lying. We don't do that in this courtroom. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, okay. Uh, right. Court of appeal says you got to have them, but in this courtroom, you don't because, right. because, you know, I mean, that's the judge was like, you know, he's got a piece of paper that says the radar was calibrated. How dare you accuse him of not having a, uh, 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 you know, <laughs> of not having uh, a, a legitimate piece of paper. Uh, and, and, you know, it was good to know, don't try, don't try an untied argument in that court. Um, so <laughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, wow. Somebody says, wow, appealable issue is a general district court. <laughs> you can appeal it up to <laughs> Here, here's the thing. That is, that's actually a legitimate question, Mister, because we talked about that. We we said, well, you you know, you can appeal it. Well, here's the problem: you appeal it up to the Supreme Court. The officer knows you're going to ask if you've got a properly certified copy, and he's going to bring one, and right. it's de novo. Uh, the are you sure the course number on the form is correct? Uh. Ooh, uh, that's interesting because we haven't received the form yet for the veterans course. Um, make sure you type the number correctly because my guess is that the number you type may be for an approval that that they are are going to be sending us hopefully very soon. Um, At least now you know it's been approved. <laughs> I'm trying to log my hours from the virtual uh, resume link, trying to find the CL certificate site. Could you please send it to me? Um, I'm just looking very quickly at some of the emails that have come in. Um, And I just found one in my spam folder. (laughs) 
which I now have to figure out how to move to my uh, in there we go. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, it's a letter I, not a number one. Somebody says so it is N I I zero, not N one one O, and then whatever the next digits are. Um, yeah, Miss Moore, I'm yeah, definitely double check the number you put in because it sounds to me like you must have put in a number for the course that's next month. Um, and uh, uh, she's, I say, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have the form in front of me right now. Uh, it's, it's 363 and you put in 306. But people are telling me it's 363. Um, and uh, hmm. well, that's interesting. Now, now I'm worried that I that I should have gotten an email from the bar telling me that the other one's been approved. And uh, check your spam folder. Yeah. <laughs> No, I just looked in my spam folder and I did find something, but it wasn't from the bar. Uh, you know, in fact, I've been wondering because they got the one for this one to us really quick. And I sent the one for February in like two days later. Uh, and I haven't heard from it. Um, Virginia is, oh, VA, maybe that's what it is. You saw VA and thought it meant Veterans Administration. Now it's Virginia Mountain Valley. Um, okay. Uh, so the number on the form is correct. That's what we've determined. And the number is NII0363. Um, and uh, Hyatt, by the way, I'll be sending you your, uh, your teaching certificate. So okay. uh, don't, don't use the one that was online. And right. Robert, you're still online too, I see. So I'll be sending that to you. Um, uh, and, you know, you can't use the teaching ones online. Uh, in fact, they need to just revise that whole online system. That has caused us more problems. Oh, you can't claim partial credit. You can't do. You can't claim credit for the same seminar twice. You can't. It's like, just make it so you fill out the form online. I mean, wouldn't that make sense? But no. Yes. <laughs> okay, folks, it's coming up to noon. I'm sure most people want to go to lunch. So, so the the John and Hyatt show is going to go offline here in a minute. <laughs> But thank you for coming. Hope to see everybody at the uh, President's Day Seminar. If you haven't signed up for that, please do so before, I think, February 9th is the deadline. It's whatever the Friday before President's Day is, which I'm pretty sure is the 9th. Um, and uh, also we've got, uh, let's see what else is coming up, uh, privacy in, uh, in nanotechnology and medicine, which I think is a fascinating subject, uh, particularly the, the, it's about privacy and the informed consent. You know, before you let them put them, those little robots in your body, um, what they're going to do with that information. They're doing a lot of uh, uh, stuff for, for uh, medical testing where they're uh, well, not medical testing. We call it uh, trials, medical trials, where they're actually monitoring people with these uh, with these uh, nanotechnology things. Uh, landlord tenant law, um, uh, which the big news in that is if you're not aware of it, the mom and pop exemption went away in, uh, in uh, 2019, uh, all landlords are now subject to the, all residential landlords are now subject to the Residential Landlord Tenant Act, even if you have only one unit, um, which uh, a lot of people did not know. Um, we've got our uh, Law Day Seminar, uh, which is gonna be on executive power and the constitution and national security. Uh, so we're going highbrow, for Law Day. Uh, and then our last seminar uh, that we've announced so far for the first half of the year is on firearm rights and regulations uh, and how to advise your clients on that. I think that's all of them. And then we've got a, one that we'll be announcing as soon as I can get the application in, uh, which is in the list of, of planned ones. And our Shredathon on June uh, 19th at the Venton War Memorial Hall with a one hour CLE. Uh, yeah, 
sign, uh, uh, sign on for our, uh, sign up for our, uh, uh, fill the coffers landlord. You'll find out a lot of stuff. They have made some really, really significant changes to the landlord tenant law and, uh, uh, including things that, that are really going to be beneficial to people, uh, who don't have a written lease because the, because one of the things is there are net, there are now, um, um, minimum terms that will apply to all, uh, uh, even month to month leases, uh, if there's not a written lease and, uh, yeah, so that's, and, uh, James Steele, uh, is a, uh, going to be doing the practical side of it. I'll be, I'll be doing the legislative side of it, which is the boring part. And then James will come in and tell you how it works in the real world. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, the old joke about uh, uh, continuing ed classes is uh, uh, say you, you go into an undergraduate class and you say, good morning, class. And everybody in the class says, good morning, professor. You go into a graduate class and you say, good afternoon, class. And everybody writes it down. And then, uh, you go into a continuing ed class and you say, good morning, everyone. And two guys in the back of the room go, he has no idea what it's like in the real world. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I know that a lot of my uh, uh, material is based on the ivory tower. Uh, it's a professional hazard of having worked for the government for 25, 26, 27 years. Um, but, yes, I do know that the real world is a lot messier. Um, so, <laughs> okay, everybody, it's 12.03. I think we've stayed online long enough. Um, only 52 of you left and I'm about to shut all of you off. I have that power. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, everybody. Oh, Zoom crash. Did I miss the CLE number? Uh, Mr. Cummings, you should be getting uh, an email from us with the CLE form if you need to get it and don't receive that email uh, later this afternoon. Uh, contact us through the website uh, or telephone me or whatever you need to do. Uh, we will do whatever it takes to make sure you get your CLE credit. So uh, I'm about to hit the end meeting button. If nobody is ever, uh, <laughs> at least says it's dinner time in France. Okay. Uh, bon appétit. Uh, enjoyed your sense of humor and was not offended by anything you said. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I feel like if I didn't defend anybody, I probably wasn't doing a good job. <laughs> Couldn't shut off the cussing participant at the beginning. Was it recorded? Yes, it was. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll also mention that that's not the worst we've had. Uh, we had a we had a, a a guy that I mean, this guy he cursed like a sailor, and he could. I would turn off his mic, and and he would think he would see it turned off, and think that meant he wouldn't be able to hear, so he'd turn it back on, and. <laughs> Anyway, okay, I'm going to hit the button in five, four, three, two, goodbye.